Please join me in prayer. Open our eyes that we might see wondrous things in your word. Amen. I want to begin this morning with two stories. The first is about an old mansion. The second is about philosopher Jacques Derrida. First, the old mansion. When I was a child, we moved across town to a house atop a hill. The driveway in our new digs ascended for about a hundred yards and our house sat at the right on the hilltop. To the left was an abandoned house we called the mansion. My three younger brothers and I used to play baseball on the mansion's front lawn. It had three trees that made part of an almost perfect diamond which we used for home, first, and third bases. Second base was usually an old garbage can lid. <laughs> In right field sat the mansion, a perfect target for left-handed batters like me. <laughs> when we used baseball lingo to talk about the short porch in right, we meant that literally. The right field fence was the mansion's front porch. One of the first home runs hit toward that short porch sailed through the mansion's second story window, which meant we were faced with a dilemma. Should we end the game because the ball was gone, or should we sneak into the mansion to find it? Four boys under 13 chose the path of adventure, so in we went. Inside, we discovered a Hollywood-esque scene, right out of some film with a haunted house. Furniture covered with white sheets, cobwebs hanging, plaster coming off the walls and ceilings, broken window glass, not just because of us, and the whole place smelled like a dank, wet basement. The main staircase was a grand, sweeping thing that curved upward. At the bottom was a chair attached to a track that ascended the length of the staircase, and next to the chair was a switchboard with buttons. One of us pushed a button, and to our delight, the chair began to move up the curved staircase to the top. The mansion was stuffed full of hidden treasures like that gliding chair, and it became for us the best clubhouse ever, at least until mom found out we were going in there and then quickly put <laughs> a stop to it. <clears throat> now for the second story about philosopher Jacques Derrida. In his biography of Derrida, Benoit Peters details Derrida's experience of discrimination at age 12. Derrida was an Arab Jew from Algiers, dark-skinned and other, from the perspective of his lighter-skinned, non-Jewish, French-speaking friends and teachers. In 1942, Derrida was expelled from school after the percentage of Jews to be admitted was lowered from 14% to 7% of the student population. Benoit Peters writes, as Derrida would often say, this exclusion was one of the earthquakes in his life. This trauma, Peters continues, left its mark on him at the deepest level and contributed to making him the person he was. Derrida himself wrote, beyond any anonymous administrative measure, which I didn't understand at all and which no one explained to me, the wound was of another order and it never healed. The daily insults from children, my classmates, the kids in the streets calling me dirty, which I might say I came to see in myself. Derrida, as many of you know, rose to become one of the most influential philosophers of the 20th century, but was at one time treated as second class, as other, and this shaped his life and even his academic work. An old mansion, reappropriated as a clubhouse to be explored and as a right field fence to be aimed at during ball games, and Derrida's childhood experience of discrimination. Both of these stories came to mind for me this week after reading today's scripture from Romans, and also after hearing on Tuesday of yet another round of threats of violence against Jewish community centers throughout the country. Today's reading from Paul's letter to the Romans is one of those texts in our tradition that has been, for centuries, used by some Christians to show that Judaism was superseded by Christianity. That Judaism was an old, 
dilapidated mansion of a religion, full of broken down theology about rules and regulations and diets and special days, a narrow and ethnocentric religion, made better, new and improved, updated and reappropriated by the universal faith-based, love-oriented religion of Christianity. I'll return to St. Paul and Christianity in a moment. But first, let me talk about the recent wave of anti-Semitism in our country. The Anti-Defamation League reported on Tuesday that since the beginning of 2017, 110 Jewish institutions have been targeted by 148 bomb threats. Four more institutions were targeted on Wednesday. The threats are so serious that the Anti-Defamation League has offered on its website five tips for talking with your children about bomb threats. There have also been waves of incidents around the country of vandalized Jewish cemeteries and anti-Semitic graffiti in public places, including right next door in Lansing. Anti-Semitic graffiti was found in Ludlowville Park two weeks ago. Now back to St. Paul. In today's reading from Romans 4, Paul contrasts faith and works. Centuries of Christians have mapped this distinction onto the two religions of Christianity and Judaism. Judaism, so the argument goes, is a religion of works, a debtor's religion, a religion of debits and credits, of trying to earn God's favor by keeping laws and rules. Christianity, by contrast, is a religion of faith, of freedom, of not working, but of trusting in God. Faith is freedom, according to this line of thinking, and thus is better. So Christianity, the religion of faith, supersedes Judaism, the religion of works. In her book, Faith and Fratricide, theologian Rosemary Radford Ruther probed the history of what she calls Christianity's killing of its parent religion, of the renovation job on the old mansion of Judaism. What Ruther says was a, quote, Christian ideological need to put Judaism behind itself. Other scholars of Christian history have traced the line from St. Paul to the Protestant reformer Martin Luther to Nazi Germany. Luther himself drew from Paul's letters to pen a treatise called On the Jews and Their Lies and called the Jews, quote, our public enemies. A recent scholar of Paul's letters, Lloyd Gaston, said that because of this line of thinking, all research on St. Paul's letters is now overshadowed by Auschwitz. And I can confess that my own research on St. Paul has been influenced by the shadow of the Holocaust and of Jewish-Christian relations. Paul's distinction between faith and works has certainly been used to justify hate, used to denigrate that classic household of faith, that grand mansion of Judaism, used to discriminate against others and experience Jacques Derrida knew personally. But here's the thing. Paul doesn't have to be read in this way as one who justifies hate. Professor of religion at Princeton, John Gager, has written that Paul can be read in a new way. And we might add that recent events in our country and even in the town next door seem to require that Paul be read in a new non-anti-Semitic way. So let me get a little wonky for a moment and offer a non-anti-Semitic reading of Paul. A reading of Paul as one of Christianity's first progressives. Here goes. At the beginning of Romans 4, Paul talks about Abraham being in a, in a relationship with God by faith and not works. For centuries, faith and works have been treated as stand-ins for Christianity and Judaism. But if we read closely, Paul is talking about chronology here, not different religions. Faith chronologically precedes works in the stories about Abraham from Genesis. In the reading from Genesis that we heard a moment ago, Abraham is promised descendants who will bless all the families of the earth. A bit later in Genesis, God leads Abraham out into the wilderness and says to him that his descendants would be so numerous, they would be like the dust that covers the earth. At that moment, according to Genesis, Abraham believed in God. He had faith. After this, God gives Abraham the first Jewish law, the first work, so to speak, 
ordering Abraham and his descendants to circumcise every male child on the eighth day, a practice that still continues in Judaism. So faith in these stories in Genesis chronologically precedes the law of circumcision. Faith precedes works. Paul, clever scholar that he was, uses this chronology in Romans 4 to argue that both Jews and Gentiles are part of Abraham's family, part of God's family, by faith. Jews are physically born into this family and follow the example of Abraham's faith by keeping the law. Gentiles, non-Jews, are adopted into this family and share a faith like Abraham's. Jews are biological descendants. Gentiles are adopted descendants. Listen to Paul in his own words in Romans 4.16. The promise depends on faith in order that it may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all Abraham's descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, that's Jews, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, that's Gentiles. For, says Paul, Abraham is the father of us all. It's wonky, but it sounds pretty inclusive to me. Paul sounds like a progressive to me. Sounds like Christianity's first progressive, advocating multiple pathways into God's family, not treating one religion as better than another, and certainly not denigrating Judaism. Paul himself was a Jew, after all. I prefer Paul the progressive to Paul the purveyor of hate. And I could imagine Paul the Progressive being an activist today. I could imagine Paul the Progressive supporting those Muslim activists who launched a crowdfunding campaign to repair a 124-year-old Jewish cemetery in St. Louis that had been vandalized. They met their goal of raising $20,000 in a few hours. The crowdfunding site said, through this campaign, we hope to send a united message from the Jewish and Muslim communities that there is no place for this type of hate, desecration, and violence in America. And I could imagine Paul the Progressive supporting an additional fundraising effort by Muslims to repair a Jewish cemetery in Philadelphia that was vandalized. They raised $151,000. And I could imagine Paul the Progressive standing side by side with subway riders in New York City. Subway riders like Jared Nide who were appalled by anti-Semitic graffiti scrawled across the subway's windows and signs. Jared Nide recounted the incident. There was a lady sitting across from me, he says, who said, oh, that's absolutely horrible. Do you think there's any way we can erase it? Nide had many times used a Sharpie when he had meant to use a dry erase marker, and he knew from experience that alcohol would work to erase the graffiti. A light bulb went on. And I asked the other riders, does anyone have hand sanitizer? Nide and several other commuters began to wipe away the graffiti, their actions captured in photographs taken by other subway riders who wrote on Facebook about the experience. A few hours later, more than 518,000 people had, re had reacted to the post on Facebook, and the post had been shared more than 350,000 times. I've never seen so many people simultaneously reach into their bags and pockets looking for tissues and Purell, said one writer. <laughs> Within two minutes, all the anti-Semitic symbolism was gone. Nye returned a bottle of hand sanitizer to one of the writers apologizing for having used most of it. We sat down and glanced around at each other and settled back into our commute, he said. And I could imagine Paul the Progressive riding another subway train, using a Sharpie pen to help New Yorkers turn a swastika into a box with four smaller boxes with the letters L-O-V-E inside. This is what New Yorkers do, said one tweet about the incident. We turn hate into love. And I can imagine Paul the Progressive cheering on Megan Phelps Roper this week. Megan was a member of the anti-gay, anti-Semitic Westboro Baptist Church. She recently told her story of leaving that church. I was a blue-eyed, chubby-cheeked five-year-old, she said, when I joined my family on the picket line for the first time. My mom made me leave my dolls in the minivan. 
I'd stand on a street corner in the heavy Kansas humidity, surrounded by a few dozen relatives with my tiny fists clutching a sign that I couldn't read yet. This was the beginning. Our protests became a daily occurrence and an international phenomenon, and as a member of Westboro Baptist Church, I became a fixture on picket lines across the country. From baseball games to military funerals, we trekked across the country with neon protest signs in hand to tell others exactly how sinful they were. In 2009, this zeal brought me to Twitter, where I had many conversations and arguments with followers. Sometimes those conversations even bled into real life. People I'd sparred with on Twitter would come out to the picket line to see me when I protested in their city. A man named David was one such person. He ran a blog called Jewlicious. And after several months of heated but friendly arguments online, he came out to see me at a picket in New Orleans. He brought me a Middle Eastern dessert from Jerusalem where he lives, and I brought him kosher chocolate and held a God hates Jews sign. <laughs> there was no confusion about our positions, but the line between friend and foe was becoming blurred. We'd started to see each other as human beings, and it changed the way we spoke to one another. It took time, but eventually these conversations planted seeds of doubt in me. My friends on Twitter took the time to understand Westboro's doctrines, and in doing so, they were able to find inconsistencies I had missed my whole life. Why did we advocate the death penalty for sinners when Jesus said, Let he who is without sin cast the first stone? How could we claim to love our neighbor while at the same time praying for God to destroy them? The truth is that the care shown to me by these strangers on the internet was itself a contradiction. It was growing evidence that people on the other side were not the demons I'd been led to believe they were. These realizations were life-altering. Once I saw that we were not the ultimate, ultimate arbiters of divine truth but flawed human beings, I couldn't pretend otherwise. I couldn't justify our actions anymore. These shifts in my perspective contributed to a larger erosion of trust in my church, and eventually it made it impossible for me to stay. I left Westboro in 2012. In those days, just after I left, the instinct to hide was almost paralyzing. I wanted to hide from the world I'd rejected for so long, people who had no reason at all to give me a second chance after a lifetime of antagonism. And yet, unbelievably, they did. I spent my first year away from home adrift with my younger sister who had chosen to leave with me. David, my Jewlicious friend from Twitter, invited us to spend time among a Jewish community in Los Angeles. We slept on couches in the home of a Hasidic rabbi and his wife and their four kids. We spent long hours of talking about theology and Judaism and life while we washed dishes in their kosher kitchen and chopped vegetables for dinner. They treated us like family. They held nothing against us, and I was astonished. Megan concludes, I can't help but see in our public discourse so many of the same destructive impulses that ruled my former church. We've broken the world into us and them, only emerging from our bunkers long enough to lob rhetorical grenades at the other camp. We write off half the country, no nuance, no complexity, no humanity. What gives me hope is that we can do something about this. The end of this spiral of rage and blame begins with one person who refuses to indulge these destructive, seductive impulses. We just have to decide that it's going to start with us. If St. Paul were here, actually if progressive Paul were here, I bet he'd applaud. Applaud the courage and wisdom of Megan Phelps Roper. Applaud the humanity of those subway riders with hand sanitizer and Sharpie pens. Applaud the generosity of those Muslim Americans who rallied to repair desecrated Jewish cemeteries. Applaud that we, progressive UCC Christians, are taking the time to mine his ancient letters for messages of inclusion and liberation, insights that can enrich our common humanity, and break the cycle of hate. Amen.